those two Bible passages may seem to be from two different planets. Can the God which Jeremiah talks about, who sends his hot desert winds of destruction as judgment on his people, be the same God who drops everything to go seeking after one of his lost sheep? How can this be one and the same God spoken of in one and the same Bible? It seems we have a contradiction here. On the one hand, God seems punitive in his judgment, while on the other hand, persistent in his mercy. On the one hand, God seems ready to abandon his people in their defiance, while on the other hand, he's intent on rescuing them from their darkness. Which God is the real God? We might want to ask. I want to suggest that it's not God whose personality is split. But it's those of us to whom God speaks. And perhaps there are two different but equally important messages to be heard in these words of Jeremiah and the Gospel of Luke. I want to talk specifically to two groups this morning. First of all, to the defiant, and secondly, to the disgusted. Anybody here ever been defiant? Yes. Anybody ever, with full knowledge and direct intent, ever violated a rule or broke a law? Anybody here ever gotten in trouble? Yeah. That you've done. <laughs> Anybody here ever directly disobeyed the orders of a superior? Oh. Now, a good many of us here today consider ourselves relatively law abiding, rule respecting, order obeying kind of folks. But I, su I suspect that if we were to do some digging into past history, even among the most pious of us gathered here today, there have been occasions of rebellious behavior at some place along the way. But maybe for many of us, our ways of defiance are more subtle than those who may fill the cells of our prisons or jails. Perhaps our defiance has been kept within the bounds of what's socially acceptable. Maybe we've never gotten arrested. Maybe our names haven't been in the paper. Maybe our mugshot's never been in the post office. But we've been our own quiet defiant. Mm -hmm. Irregardless of whether our defiance has earned us a criminal record or not, God has a message in his word for, for the defiant. There are consequences for our actions. You know, it's what your mama taught you, right? If you have a good mama, there are consequences for your actions. If you tell a lie, it is eventually going to catch up with you. If you cheat somebody, they're going to have a hard time ever trusting you again. If you steal something, well, you're going to be found out, and eventually you'll have to either return it or pay a fine. If you're selfish with what you have, then what? Then when you have needs, others may be less likely to give to you. If you drink too much alcohol, or if you do illegal drugs, your life more than likely is going to head down a path of self-destruction. Mm -hmm. If you smoke cigarettes, let's just be honest, it's more likely you're going to develop cancer or heart disease, and you're going to die at an earlier age. If you don't give time to your family, and you don't pay attention to your children because you put work or hobbies first, then your relationships will suffer. All of those things are called what? Consequences. Consequences. God has designed a world with consequences. Now, in the words from Jeremiah, we are reminded that consequences of individual choices and behavior can take on global dimensions. If we pour pollutants into our air and water and land in the name of profit and greed, then 
we're likely to lose irreplaceable natural resources and threaten the delicate balance of our ecological system and our earth is getting hotter and hotter and the storms are getting stronger and stronger. If we in the developed, rich nations of this world hoard the world's resources because we're more advanced at utilizing them, then persons in other parts of the world may die by the thousands, if not more, by hunger and starvation. If we make the pursuit of material wealth our highest goal and ignore our spiritual lives, well, then our culture will drift into a sea of moral chaos and emptiness. Those are consequences. The word gives to us, the word God gives to us is that we can expect consequences when we live in defiance of his intention for our lives. But the question which has baffled humankind for all of time is why did the innocent suffer consequences? We've yet to find a satisfactory answer to that question. But indeed, we do know that consequences sometimes spill into the lives of the innocent. We do, I believe, a major disservice to our children when we fail to allow them to experience consequences. And yet, it's one of the great struggles that most of us as parents face, that pull between protecting our children from the pain of consequences versus bailing them out of their troubles and teaching them a valuable life lesson. The word to the defiant is clear. Wander away from God's path and an inevitable price will be paid. But there's also a message in today's scripture for those who stayed, pretty much stayed on the path. Stayed on the path, done the right things, obeyed the law, worked hard, kept your nose clean. There's a message in this scripture for today for those who find themselves in that category. Because maybe you're there, but you're fed up. You're fed up and you're disgusted. For we who are part of the 99 who get left behind while the shepherd goes off after the one has wandered away are disgusted. Sometimes we're resentful <coughs> and we're prideful. After all, we crossed the rugged journey of life's terrain and we kept ourselves on track. Nobody's ever had to waste their time and money trying to get us back on the right path. We've done it all on our own. We've pulled are the elder son in the prodigal story. Remember that story? We've stayed on the farm and we've worked hard. We've done what's expected of us and nobody's ever thrown us a party. We're the laborer who's worked a full day and then some and then we come to the end of the day and the guy who's only been there an hour gets the same pay. And we're angry about it. Oh, we might not admit we're angry. But we are angry. That's what every survey of American, the American public says. Folks are angry. And because there's so many of us that feel the same way, after all, there's 99 of us. We're the moral majority. It's very easy for us to get on a bandwagon. And we start commiserating in our disgust about all the no-counts, the welfare cheats, the criminals, the drug addicts. And pretty soon, we find ourselves feeding our own egos off of how much better we are than the rest of those folks out there. Let's be honest. How many of us have found ourselves in that category from time to time? And I'll admit, when you work in the human service field, as we do here, it's hard sometimes not to get jaded. You know that word? 
When you see people abuse the system, return time and again without seeming to make any effort to change, it's hard not to reach a point sometimes when you think, well, I'm not wasting my time anymore. I'm not wasting my energy anymore on that person. But the Word of God says something different. Through His servant Luke, the Word of God confronts our pessimism. Luke says, God seeks the lost, and God never gives up until they are found. Yeah. There's a song I used to sing. I haven't sung it recently because my company tracks on a cassette tape. <laughs> But the song says, in heaven's eyes, there are no losers. In heaven's eyes, there are no hopeless causes. Because there's only people like you and people like me who need God's grace. Luke also says, and this is what sometimes makes the disgusted folks even angrier. Luke says there is more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Not only does Jesus confront our pessimism about the lost, but he points out the sin of our disgust. He, Jesus reveals his disdain for the arrogance in which we compare all others and their experience to our own experience. And Jesus lets us know that where God's heart rests is with the lost. Jesus teaches us that God wants his people to leave the comfort of the 99 and the seekers of the lost. Now, not many folks take the risk to do that. Instead, too often, Christ Church gathers in our so-called holy places, and we simply gather there to ruminate about the shameful lives of the lost, but never leave the safety of our fold to seek them. We draw comfort from the fact that we're not one of them, but we also never experience the joy, the indescribable heavenly joy of celebrating the lost being found. Amen. Blanche Jordan, who back in the 1950s wrote a version of the Gospels called the Cotton Patch, he says about this parable, he says that when this fellow finds his lost sheep, he takes the sheep home with him. And he brings that little lost sheep right into the living room. And he says, hey, look, I got my sheep. And his wife says, get that sheep out of my living room. He's going to make a mess. Get it out. I just vacuumed in here. Now that's a crazy thing to do. A man to do with a lost sheep. But he's so happy he got that lost sheep that he, he brings it in. And even though that sheep was making quite a stink. You ever smell a sheep? <laughs> he said, I want him in my living room. Here he is my lost sheep and I found him. Do we get the point? Jesus is saying that God Almighty is that kind of God. He goes on to say there is more joy over a single outsider who reshapes his life than over 99 righteous people who don't need to change. God desperately wants us to surrender our disgust at the world. We have no right to be disgusted. He wants us to let go of our elder brother chip on our shoulder and to open ourselves to experience the joy of welcoming the lost. For the irony of it is that if those of us who may be self-righteously holding on to our disgust continue to do so, we're also going to God's kingdom and we too will be lost 
before we know it. The bottom line is, whether you're the defiant or the disgusted, it doesn't matter. We all need, and we've all been given, the mercy of Almighty God. Humbly we bow our heads before you this day, Lord. Not here to judge or examine the lives of anyone else but ourselves. And humbly we come before you, acknowledge, uh, acknowledging our need of your life-saving and amazing grace. 